Welcome from the studios of KPBS-TV at San Diego State University. The International Training Center today brings us all together in this teleconference joining Mexico, the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, Paraguay, Brazil, Argentina, and the United States of America. We would like to thank Keystone Communications, Telecomunicaciones de México, PanamSat, and BrazilSat for their satellite linkage services, which make this all possible today. Welcome to our program on health as a strategic resource for enhanced productivity, effective management of quality care. This is the fourth video conference of the series Principles for World-Class Performance. I am Dr. Michael Real, Director of the School of Communication here at San Diego State University and your moderator for this teleconference. Today's program is composed of two presentation modules and two question and answer sessions. We look forward to your live participation. Increasingly, today's government leaders, educators, and managers are focusing on health management and delivery issues as their major concern for enhanced productivity. The health of our workers has become more important given the dramatic changes we have seen in the workplace in recent years. These changes include the trend toward drastic organizational downsizing, automation, the increased multiculturalism of our workers, the empowerment of personnel, increased stress levels, and never-ending organizational change. This video conference will review some of the trends and innovative views of government regulatory agencies and health leaders in the United States in their quest to find new formulas and programs to help workers and employees in this troubling challenge. It will also review some of the key issues in providing quality health care at an affordable cost and a new integrated management approach for providing health services to optimize the use of the available technolo technology infrastructure, medical resources, and client satisfaction. This model could be applicable internationally to both public and private health providers. It is a pleasure to introduce to you today's expert speaker, Dr. James Nelson. Dr. Nelson has been Medical Director, International Affairs, Scripps Memorial Hospital in La Jolla, and Clinical Professor of Neurosciences at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine for nearly 25 years. He received his Doctor of Medicine degree with honors at the University of Washington and later held the position of Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of California, Los Angeles School of Medicine. Dr. Nelson was the founding president of the California Neurological Association in 1972 and has been extensively involved with the international business development of health service providers. He is a member of the California Telemedicine, Telehealth Commission, in charge of surveying tele telemedicine needs of rural hospitals and chairman of the International Medical Committee at Scripps Memorial Hospital. He has had ample experience in Mexico. Dr. Nelson has published extensively and participated in numerous conferences and symposia around the world. Welcome. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Let us begin with an introductory question. Many people feel that the incredible advances in medical technology and facilities in recent years, uh, the management and delivery of health services to employees and individual users, would become a less complex task and easier to streamline compared to other industries. But the many debates today indicate this might not be true. Why is that? Well, a simple answer might be is that it's because we're running out of money. Now, 20, 25 years ago, as we'll see in the first module in a minute, uh, we're going to review how it seemed that we had uh, unlimited or enough money to pay for the medical services that anyone needed. The, the low income person or even the wealthy. But the problem now is is that the resources of money are being squeezed that every segment of the health care delivery system, doctors, the hospitals, 
uh, any of the technical people. We simply do not have enough resources for unlimited care. And so our whole focus today is going to be how can we plan for the inevitable rationing that we must do. Thank you very much for your comments. Let us begin with Module 1, in which Dr. Nelson will explain the realities of today's health care trends. In this module, we're going to discuss a phenomenon that has occurred in the practice of medicine in the U.S. called managed care. Now, the practice of medicine and the delivery of health care worldwide, but particularly in the U.S., has undergone a radical revision in the past two decades. Costs are spiraling upward. Medical technology is becoming increasingly complex, and yet we all want it. We see the advantages of having highly technical care when the need is there. Financial resources are becoming less available to keep up with these needs of all the patients in what we could call the medical arena. We're going to start to review the major changes that have occurred in particularly the physician and hospital sectors of the medical arena. We're going to discuss managed care and its impact on the lives of doctors. I'll often be very personal about this because my main expertise is uh, based on a 30-year career, both in academic and private practice medicine, as a specialist in neurology. I'm going to be very critical of several undesirable trends that I sense in the healthcare industry. And at the end, though, we will, in the second module, discuss a new highly revolutionary plan that involves myself and our own hospital and our community that uh, is an exciting uh, return to a patient-focused, patient-centered style of medicine. This is basically going to involve a radical new partnership between hospital organizations and we doctors, and we hope that this will re reverse the trend of high administrative uh, insurance company or health corporation uh, expenses or profits and take these profits uh, that now uh, have led to the accumulation of billions of dollars and revert this money back to direct patient care. The uh, current what is called corporatization of medical care is something that we uh, physicians uh, do not like to see happen. It, it tries to incorporate us. It tries to buy up hospitals and build a uh, separate industry that is uh, then financed by investors on Wall Street. And we frankly believe that the accumulation of vast amounts of money through stock market manipulation of such companies um, should instead be turned back towards funding of direct patient care. Now let us first uh, look at a slide that examines the traditional model of medical care as it was, say, 20 years ago or so. The next figure shows uh, the payers in the box at the top. Uh, that is basically still the same as the patient. And you could see that the patient related to a hospital if he was ill and had to be interned uh, directly to a specialist because he had full choice of specialists. And also he had his primary care physician who related as the arrows show, to either the specialist or to the hospital. This was a wonderful system. There seemed to be enough money in society and enough money for employers to be able to afford private insurance for their patients, for their employees who are patients. Uh, there were large revenue centers. What we mean by that is that the 
large high-tech hospitals, large medical groups, MRI centers and the like were high revenue producing centers of excellence. From the payer's standpoint, he saw, though, that there were no cost control. So the first roots of difficulty began to occur. In the next figure, we see a brief summary then of this past style of medical care from about 1970 to 1985 in the US. There was an efficient, effective system of delivery. There was a public uh, sector uh, as well. Not everyone had money for care, but we had state or government funded hospitals that took care of the 15 to 20 percent of patients who were unable to afford care. The veterans of the wars of, through um, a separate Veterans Administration hospital system had their uh, excellent uh, system of contained care with their own hospitals, their own doctors, and uh, a highly effective system. One of the funding uh, of this type of uh, private sector medicine, however, uh, on the third line is emphasized that there was a cost plus retrospective reimbursement plan. What we mean by that is that the government insurance companies such as Medicare that was put into place to take care of the one-third of the aging population uh, was reimbursing the hospitals as were the private insurance companies for whatever it cost to take care of the patient plus a reasonable amount of profit for the institution. Well this again was an unchecked, unregulated method of delivering uh, particularly the hospital uh, portion of health care. Hospitals and medical groups began to compete and build expensive buildings and bought expensive new machines to uh, be more effective in their competition with each other. The cost of this Medicare and Medicaid government health expenditures, expenditures climbed rapidly. Medicaid, by the way, is the uh, state uh, type of uh, health insurance for um, patients unable to afford to buy individual insurance or pay cash. This is called Medicaid for the 50 states of the United States. But in California, where I live, it's called Medi-Cal. I might refer to those similarly. Some of the uh, dangerous signs that this unrestricted health care system was going to fail were that costs to the purchaser of individual health insurance plans began to escalate dramatically. In fact, national health expenditures overall doubled in the 1980s. The next figure shows a graph of the total health care expenditures for the United States from 1971 to the year 2000. And you can see on the graph, and this is in billions of U.S. dollars, you can see that in 1985 we spent five hundred billion on health care but shortly after 1990 in about 1992 this now reached one trillion dollars a number that I can't uh, begin to even uh, conceptualize now in response to these seemingly unchecked uh, medical costs and runaway competition in the healthcare industry with new machines, new technologies at every nearby hospital. A technique entitled managed care was developed. And this by definition 
is a series of purchasing techniques that employers particularly uh, found attractive. And this was a way of buying various portions of the healthcare network to meet the needs of their individual employees. It led to direct bargaining with individual health providers by encouraging or even requiring that their employees choose their medical services from a select group of providers. And remember provider, we mean either the hospital or the physicians. This managed care strategy set new limits on fees. It rationed specialty care. These are the two major parts of what managed care attempts to do. And its critics say some of this uh, uh, perhaps is not proper, particularly the part about rationing care. What we mean by that is that the primary care physicians who were the the point of first entry for care in managed care, it was thought that there has been excessive regulation or denial of services to, by referral to specialty physicians. So in other words, in comparison to the old traditional system, a patient with a migraine headache couldn't just come off the street with his insurance card and come directly to me as a neurologist specialist. He first had to either go see or at least get clearance by the telephone through his primary care office to see the alleged more expertise specialist. This uh, has greatly compromised the ability of patients to gain direct access of the type of care that they've wanted and we will see later in module two how we hope that a reorganization of some of the ways in which we approach our patients might allow for that free choice, choice to be restored and yet be uh, able to be paid for, in other words, still to be a cost effective. Now, the, in the next slide we see a line diagram then of the managed care model that contrasts with the traditional model. We still have the payer, which is the patient at the top, but now he is directed only to go to his primary care physician, not allowed to directly go to his favorite specialist, and certainly not allowed to just drop on the door of the hospital, hoping to be uh, accepted with open arms. Now, I shouldn't say that. The hospital administrators in America will be uh, mad at me for saying that because it's a tradition in our country that no one is turned away from an emergency room uh, regardless of ability to pay. We're proud in America that that system, that tradition uh, still holds, but if you had like an elective that is a uh, procedure an elective procedure is one that could occur tomorrow or could occur next week. Let's say a uh, removal of a gallbladder. Well, in this instance, the patient doesn't just show up at the hospital door and tell the ad admissions office that I'm here for my gallbladder operation. He must first check with his primary care physician, and the primary care physician must then check with the managed care insurance company or the provider of the money to um, gain approval that that procedure is indicated and that it's all right to go to the hospital that he desires because the managed care organization might have a contract with another hospital down the street for a lower price for that gallbladder removal. So I think you get the idea. 
The managed care model then, uh, as we look at this figure, seems to eliminate a certain freedom of choice. It now shifts the specialist, the physician's office, the hospital into now being looked at as a cost center, not a place to just dump money and have no accounting for exactly what it cost for each component of the care. The major meaning of this managed care phenomenon then is that it created a major paradigm shift of power from the provider to the payer in health care negotiations. Let us look at the next figure and which summarizes these points. Our old model that we talked about where the providers, namely we doctors in the hospitals, were the king and in the new model that could even possibly be applicable for planning in some public health care markets, we now have the payer, the king. The patient, the one who has the money, is going to set the criteria for how medicine will evolve. So we go then from a provider-driven to a payer-driven paradigm, from price-insensitive to price sensitive, where quality and service was based primarily on the procedure, other, any procedure, in other words, that we wanted to do, we would just do it and we would get paid for it, until now we're going to look very hard at the quality of any procedure that is performed and its exact cost. We're, we were having to give up some freedom of choice to now limit our choices as funds are not as highly available. We are shifting from an inpatient focus to an ambulatory focus. A physician customer now becomes a physician partner with the patient and with other health care organizations. The specialists seem to drive much of the planning for health care. Now we're shifting under managed care to a primary care emphasis. For risk factors, in the old model, the payer was primarily at risk. That means at risk of his money that he was paying. Whereas under the new model, the provider of health care is at risk. This is a bit difficult to grasp, but it means that the provider must plan to give certain services for a certain amount of money and if he goes over that and if he has to expend more money for providing a gallbladder removal or whatever it is he now takes part of the risk I hope you understand that concept other changes that are important were that Medicare set the pace by restricting the reimbursement for both hospital and physician services to a degree that has had a profound irreversible impact on revenues of doctors and of hospitals. For example, they uh, have just arbitrarily, I could say, or through planning, cut the cost, cut the reimbursement of gallbladder removals, medical specialty examinations, all services have been drastically reduced in terms of revenue for the doctors and hospitals by at least one-third. Another major uh, occurrence of the last decade is a shift towards providing many procedures in outpatient settings. This was possible because of technical advances and also more efficient methods and this has been a great savings for employers, we're now seeing one of the first benefits for the payer, the patient, and his employer who provides insurance. Hospital bed days were now shortened. Many procedures could now be done outside the hospital. So this has represented the first ever drop in that segment of cost. However, uh, hospitals have tended to keep the charges for their services high 
despite the following or falling of hospital census statistics because of the shift to the outpatient arena. This situation is now changing. Hospitals are finding that they are able to remain uh, viable financially by converting empty beds to lower cost chronic care units. This eliminates excessive administrative staff and finally they are also using cost-based accounting methods rather than the previous cost plus reimbursement that they were uh, that they enjoyed now this change this managed care change affects both private and non-for-profit hospitals another trend is for these hospitals to join together into large networks to streamline their administrative operations to form purchasing alliances for supplies and now as we will cover in module two we are contemplating partnerships of various types with doctor groups to devise whole new health systems with new ways of sharing the revenue of health care. A further comment on the financing of managed health care uh, in this interesting evolution is to examine the uh, evolution from a fee-based fee-for-service based method to what eventually will be called the capitation method. Uh, in the next figure we see a slide that shows the evolution of managed care plans from the old days in 1980 where the insurer used uh, a fee-for-service uh, method to reimburse we doctors there was in complete risk at that time to the uh, funds of the insurer and the patient. But as time has gone by, up to the year 2000, we have eventually evolved to a discounted fee for service method, which means negotiation for a lesser fee, but still relatively open negotiations, to a per diem basis, that means you'll be paid in a hospital whatever it costs for one day of care, a fixed amount, to a per case method of reimbursement. Here, this is called the DRG method, disease-related groups. In other words, if you have cancer of the prostate, you are paid a global fee for care of that patient, whether it's inpatient, outpatient, or whatever. And finally, as the managed care phenomenon evolves, to a per capita method. And this is becoming increasingly popular. In other words, the physicians or their groups are given so many dollars per month to take care of the patient regardless of the complexity of the problem that develops. It is alleged that attention to careful preventative health methods can make this a profitable method for providers even though the cost is reduced to the patient compared to other methods. The financial risk in a capitated system then is increasingly borne by the provider, the doctors and the hospitals, in contrast to the insurer in the traditional system.